Hey everyone, what's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the seven game main slate that we have here on Thursday, uh, June 15. Nice to have a sort of middling slate here on a Thursday. Um, it is getaway day for a lot of teams. Some teams be getting four game sets going into the weekend here tonight. Um, so we usually don't get something like this on a Thursday. So it's nice to have a nice little seven gamer. I, I like these middling sort of slates here. Um, so we've got Shohei on the mound today, and we've got some shenanigans so far. Um, get a spinning wheel here. It's no good. Um, in in the uh, ownership and the and the projections for Shohei, um, as we normally do, we still can't figure this out somehow. The models across the industry uh, to auto adjust our stuff when he's on the mound. So some places like look at this ownership standard deviation with everybody else mostly in in pretty short ranges here, he's well above 13. So our ownership stuff uh from the broader industry, this will get fixed throughout the day. Um but as of right now, like you can't take a lot out of this 19% projected ownership on Shohei. Um like he'll he'll be 35 and 40 percent this will probably double by the end of the day um so we'll see how that fleshes out same with the projection it's low because some places still have him projected as a hitter um i can't really manually correct for that at the moment so we'll just have to wait until the models update so keep an eye out for that as um at, as things change throughout the day that said um a couple obvious spots here today stroman gets pittsburgh in in a Wrigley anti-weather game, um, anti-win game, I, uh, I suppose. Uh, Sonny Gray gets to Tigers, okay, who did their bad. Um, maybe some kind of bad matchups up here at the top for Christian Javier, Shohei, and Eovaldi. Might be able to get off of some of this up top. Uh, Dylan Cease gets to Dodgers. I'm not, I never, I'm not playing him anyway, um, and maybe a couple of sneaky tournament spots price adjusted for these guys down here at the bottom. Like, look at some of these projections for guys in the 5Ks. They're popping for 12 and 13 points. Um, same number as Dylan Cease up here, and he's 3K more expensive, right? So uh, I think we can get to some of these cheaper guys down here. We haven't had access to really decent value uh, recently, at least on main slates, um, with super cheap arms to get a little bit more balanced and go kind of mid-range in our, our lineup constructions. Um, I think that's on the table here today. But once again, we, you know, we can we can do a lot of really cool things, I think, and still get different, even though it is kind of a short slate. We got a big chalk, right, probably coming into Atlanta. We'll talk about this game a little bit, you know, when we get to it. Um, so you're going to have to make some some choices here. And I think there are some spots that are, at least as yet, coming in uh, a little off the board, and they could serve to be uh, pretty equitable for us. So let's just get into it uh, and start with Detroit and Minnesota. Matt Boyd, I think, may be one of those spots. He's 5,800 on the mound, and this projection so far is a fine number, right? He's popping 27 in the value score, and that's fine for a guy sub-6,000. Um, what we're really worried about with Matt Boyd I mean, historically, he's given up too much contact to the right-handers, given up hard contact, power, homers to righties. And that's kind of uh, fleshing out here again this season. Um, you know, 33% hard contact is not a bad figure, but it's elevated for sure. More fly balls, right? 075 ground ball to fly ball to the righties, 1.6 homers per nine, 190 ISO, give or take, 23% strikeout rate. Um can't really take anything out of the lefty numbers here, of course. Um, you know, it is just a pretty tiny sample still so far. Teams are still stacking at when they can. A lot of righties against Boyd. Uh, aggregate, just 22% strikeout rate. That's about average, right? Nine and a half, ten percent 10% walk rate. It's a little concerning there. But he's always got, had kind of a, a fishy walk rate here. He's throwing strike one which is good, 65%. He's got good chase, good swing strikes, right? 28% CSW, it's all excellent, right? Plate discipline-wise. Where we struggle here is throwing strikes deeper in the count, 
right? He stays off of the barrel, which is good. And in aggregate, I think all of those plate discipline numbers here uh, mostly put him in play at 5,800 against the Twins. Twins are dreadful, man, against left-handed pitching. Look at this. Just 500 PAs, not as many as some other teams, but a 27% strikeout rate. That's far and away the, the worst split-adjusted number on the day. Where they are most attackable here is somebody that can't throw it past them. Now, with Matt Boyd, I think this is an upside spot for him. However, with the righties here from Minnesota, they still make a lot of hard contact. 35%, that's a pretty big number, team adjusted. Neutral ground ball to fly ball, which is good. Line drive rate north of 21%, also good. However, infield fly ball rate, very, very high here, pushing 14%. So really what we're seeing is some soft and hard contact, right? Not a lot of medium, medium contact, sub 50%. That's kind of surprising for a team adjusted number. Um, so a good bit of soft contact, good bit of hard contact, right? But not a lot of power, a lot of popped up fly balls, a lot of strikeouts. So what that really leads to, to for the Twins is kind of a, a tournament type of build with a lot of variance, right? They're going to strike out a lot and they're going to hit, you know, when they hit the baseball in the air and over, it'll probably go over the wall because they're making a good bit of hard contact when that happens. Um, either that or they're just going to pop it up on the infield. So that said, they're going to stack a lot of righties against Matt Boyd here tonight. Um, almost certainly Donnie Solano, Willie Castro hit from both sides. Carlos Correa at 4,000. This is a really good play, I think, here tonight. Uh, Kyle Farmer, he's fine at 2,500 dual eligibility. He'll likely be in the middle of the lineup. That's a damn good play, I think. Um, Minnesota actually popping the hardest in value score so far. Ryan Jeffers behind the plate, Royce Lewis, right? They're probably going to go eight strong from the right side of the plate here tonight. So you're going to want guys that can mostly be about neutral ground ball to fly ball guys. Um, not so much getting the baseball in the air because Matt Boyd's going to induce fly balls, right? And that's not necessarily what we want. We want line drives and ground balls that can turn into line drives and potentially hard contact that can go over the wall. So all of that considered, um, I think it's going to be a tough matchup for Matt Boyd. He's 5,800, though, and that puts him in play at, at sub-10% ownership here tonight. We got some expensive offenses we're probably going to want to get to, and uh, Matt Boyd makes this happen. However, the Twins, as we just talked about, like they're very cheap, and if you need a cheap stack... I mean, you're not going to be fooling anybody because they're going to come in probably top three or four in ownership stack-wise. Um, they're cheap, and they can make all kinds of different constructions happen for you as well. So I think both sides are in play, Twins and Matt Boyd. If I had to choose, oof, um, I'd probably just side with the Twins. I think there's more upside at their relative price tags than for Matt Boyd having to get through all of them. But uh, I think this is okay, landing on some of this. Uh, maybe a couple other 5K arms that uh, are in play, too. We'll get to those in a minute. Sonny Gray on the other side, 9,300 for him. Uh, this is fantastic. I want to get a lot of this as well. And unfortunately, every time I want to get a lot of a guy in a killer matchup, um, they just kind of pee all over themselves and make me look like a moron. So hopefully that doesn't happen here with Sonny Gray. Tigers are just like... You know, they're making a run for the division, I guess, when after they just showed that they could take apart Spencer Strider. Um, difference between Strider and Sonny Gray, like, obviously Strider's got more strikeout stuff and yada, yada, yada. Sonny Gray's got six pitches here, and Strider has two, right? So that's a, a huge, huge difference. Every single one of these pitches is giving Sonny Gray value. And the Tigers over here are still the Tigers, okay? Just 82 WRC plus for them. Split adjusted in 2,000 PAs against righties this year. Tick and a half. And this is actually two ticks above average on the slate today. Um, split adjusted. The strikeout rate, 25, 24.5%. Buck 25 ISO, this is not good. Now, they do have Kerry Carpenter back. Zach McKinstry's been hitting for a little bit of power. Torque hit a bomb yesterday off of Strider. 2,800 at the top. He's fine. Uh, 31.5% hard. And, like, all of these numbers are mostly pretty average and below average for the Tigers. So, Sonny Gray, an above-average arm, who's been struggling recently. We have to keep in mind, though, that a lot of his recent matchups have been pretty poor. Uh, has had Cleveland, 
right? He had the Dodgers. Um, he had Toronto. He had Houston. San Francisco's not the easiest matchup in the world necessarily. He's had Cleveland a couple times, as a matter of fact, right? Earlier in the season when Sonny was really um, – was was really kind of cruising. He had Houston when they were striking out a crap load. Uh, the White Sox when everybody was hurt. He had the Yankees once. He had the Royals a couple of times, et cetera, et cetera. And in his, in his last six, seven starts, he's had those difficult matchups, as we mentioned, Dodgers, Cleveland twice, Houston, Toronto, again, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that said, long-winded way of saying, I want to get to as much Sunny Gray as I can here, but uh, Field's going to do the same. I don't really care, I think. Um, getting chalky on the mound here, I think is fine today. There's plenty of spots that we can get different with. We'll get to those, whether it's with hitters or with other pitchers. Um, so I'm fine eating this today. I think the Tigers are terrible. Um, what we're really worried about was that we need some more depth out of him. He's throwing a lot of pitches here and slightly elevated walker. He's normally had normally historically had an impeccable walk rate. This is elevated about, you know, double his career averages here. So that's a little bit concerning. Um, strand rate is high for Sonny, so if you want to get to some leverage stacks on the other side, play McKinstry, Torque, and a Kerry Carpenter, for example. Uh, I think everybody else is dreadful, and they're probably going to strike out a lot in this particular matchup. Um, so probably just the top three for me, and nobody's going to be playing them anyway. So I'd rather just eat the top three guys and, and just see what happens if I'm getting there. Uh, I think those are fine constructions with... Some some viable hitters there. Kerry Carpenter's got a lot of upside from the left side of the plate. Um, but every number for Sunday here is pretty damn good the entire season, even considering his last six starts, six, eight starts, um, have not really been great. But he's back down to 9300 today, and I think this price tag is too cheap for him in this particular matchup. So um, he's the guy I want to get to in the 9K and probably even in the 10K range. But I think pretty much everybody's in play here to one degree or another. This is just a seven-game slate. Okay, Kyle Freeland and the Braves. Um, they're getting the Braves. AJ Smith-Shaver on the other side. Interesting pitching matchup here, mostly because of the sort of background fundamental shenanigans we've got going on here. Braves played a, a doubleheader yesterday, and they got in pretty late last night. Um, Colorado Rockies, right, they were in Boston. They had a two-hour rain delay in that game. And they didn't start that till 9 Eastern, and they didn't get into their hotel at about 3, 4 in the morning in Atlanta. Um, so it's kind of tough here <laughs> for both of these teams, travel likely to be wearing on them or weighing on them a little bit. That said, I mean, this is a damn good spot for Atlanta contact-wise. Um, of course, Atlanta's got you know split adjusted. They've got the best numbers of any team on the day here. 660 PAs, buck 37 WRC plus. That's a monster figure against lefties this year. 21.5% K rate, 41% aggregate hard contact rate. Uh, this isn't just like with a couple of hitters. This is for the entire team. They have been elite against lefties this season. 380 Woba with a 295 average, 245 ISO. I mean, just insanely difficult for any lefty to get through this team. But they're going to be mega popular today. They'll be far and away the most popular team. In early ownership runs, we're only showing about 15% aggregate ownership on them um, as a as a team. But I mean that that number is going to be way higher. You'll see 40% ownership on on guys like Austin Riley and Ronald Acuna tonight in some individual contest like you'll see Sean Murphy he'll be very popular as well Marcel as soon as 3600 um I'm, I'm sure he'll be in the lineup in in you know the middle probably the five or the six tonight and he'll be 30 plus percent so it's going to be difficult to navigate this ownership on the Braves here tonight so I think at 5,000 here with Kyle Freeland like he, he doesn't have overwhelming whiff stuff but he's got very good fastball equity here like for Kyle Freeland I mean this would probably be pretty surprising numbers like these are two of the best fastballs relative to the less to the rest of the league in baseball right there's not many starting pitchers that get two did you know out and a half and two outs above league average on two different fastballs um 
and it's Kyle Freeland who has a 16% aggregate strike rate, strikeout rate. So I bet those are kind of surprising numbers. 5,000, that puts him in play here. Now, he doesn't have a lot of raw upside, right? This is a horrible, horrible matchup. Don't get me wrong. He gives up 39% hard contact with a 207 ISO, 15% strikeout rate, and fly balls to the right side here. But he doesn't walk anybody. 6% walk rate. The control is great. That's because of the fastball command. Stays down in the strike zone, certainly to the left side of the plate, not so much to the righties because he throws a lot of a two-seamer. But he has some equitable pitches here, and he's got five of them that he goes to work with. Now, the secondary offerings are bad, right? Rough changeup because it's only a five, four and five mile an hour velo delta off of these fastballs. He's only throwing 90 miles an hour. So that's not great. Right, slider, not great. He induces a little bit more whiffs to the left side with the slider than he does the righty. What he tries to do with this the slider, though, against right-handers, against whom he throws it a good bit, is bury it in on the hands and kind of back foot. Um, and sometimes he just misses location. That's when he gets over the barrel a little bit with this pitch. But it's a serviceable pitch against right-handers, even though he gives up outs to the field on it. Um, same with the curveball. It's not all that great. So, all in all, um, obviously it's a good spot for the Braves here. What I think is playable, it, of course it's Atlanta. They're expensive, though. you got to pay for these guys, right? Acuna, I think he's probably still underpriced, though, at 6600 He should be 68 We He might be the first guy, including Shohei, that we see crack 7000 if he keeps stealing bases and hitting baseball over the wall at this kind of rate. Um you know, Austin Riley's 5300 It's a good price for him. But Ozzie Albee's 48 Murphy, 49 Matt Olson is 6200 Like, what are we doing? Um, so they're hard to get to, and they're going to be mega popular. So they kind of they kind of pigeonhole you into a very similar build to the rest of the field because there's no positional flexibility with them. Every single one of them is eligible only at a single uh, position here on DK at least. So that makes that hard to play. And when you got to eat a lot of ownership on them, I mean, that's super difficult to get different with it. So I think Kyle Freeland, he may be in play. He has 15 and 20 point upside in the tank as a starting pitcher. Don't get me wrong. This is a horrible spot for him, but he's 5,000. We've seen this several times in particular with Rockies pitchers in the last several days for context. Each of the three guys starting for the Rockies in Boston, they had median projections two points lower than this, right? And Kyle Freeland now gets a far worse matchup, and he's popping for two points higher. Now, two points is not a huge deal, but when the projection is this low, two points is two points, and that's a it's actually a pretty damn big deal, right? So... When we need to, like on these shorter slates like this, we sometimes need to get granular, and we have to figure out equitable spots to avoid when we have to eat a lot of ownership on on some spots that we really do like, like a Sunny Gray, for example. Um, again, like it's not like Atlanta is a bad play here, but their ownership might steam to levels that could put us on to Kyle Freeland. And you could see him go five and even six innings here. He goes deep into games. He is stretched out, right? He... he goes at least five innings even if he's getting bludgeoned so bad matchup and you're gonna have to have some braves if you're building a bunch of teams in a single entry i would probably come off of this because their ownership is going to be so so high there's plenty of other teams with as much upside on today's slate that i i think you could probably uh, you'll certainly see lower ownership on uh, that you could probably get to so um, I think that puts him in play at 5,000 in very deep tournament stuff. Like, you're not playing this in 20 max or anything. Like, let's not get crazy. Um, but can you fade Atlanta in short tournament stuff? Yeah, I, th- I think so. Their ownership is going to be very, very high. Uh, AJ smith is going on the, on the mound for them, 5,500. He's also pretty popular at 20%. In order to fit in Atlanta or the Dodgers or whoever, you got to play somebody cheap on the mound, right? So like, you're obviously not going to play Freeland and then stack Atlanta against him or anything like that. So what's likely going to happen here is you're going to see smith on the mound at a very high ownership figure against the Rockies with Atlanta stacks, right? So you're not really making all that much headway when you stack 
when you correlate a team with Smith Shaver and Atlanta here, right? So all of these Atlanta teams are going to be very simi- similar and very popular. So it's kind of difficult to get super excited about this outside of the fundamental matchup. So Smith Shaver here, I really like this arm. It's a live arm. He's only got two, two and a half pitches here. Curveball using it just a little bit here so far. He's mostly a four-seamer slider. I'm concerned mostly with depth. He did go five and a third in his last start, five and two-thirds, something like that. Um, I think that puts him in play against the Rockies. However, it's mostly the price tag. It's not the ownership that I'm super jacked about, but look at this projection, 14 points in a median value here so far. It is pretty high. Good, good value score at north of 35 for somebody down here in this range. This is a damn good play. So if I had to choose, I'd probably just play H. smith Shaver, fade Atlanta, maybe play a piece here or there to get some coverage, and then go elsewhere with a, with a main stack or something like that. Um, so I think he's a good play for sure, but again, we got to consider ownership on a very cheap pitcher um, in a difficult spot. Rockies are still pretty okay against right-handed pitching, 88 WRC+, plus. the strikeout rate's ticking down, right? Still a lot of hard contact, still a very high line, line drive rate. Not going to hit the ball over the wall, but this is still a hitter's ballpark down in Atlanta. Um, mostly, I'm kind of off of offense a little bit here. It's because of the shenanigans and the travel schedules for these two teams. Rockies have had three rain, four rain delays or something in the last uh, four days. Um, so they've been really fighting it, and it's screwed up their travel schedule here. So you might just see what's kind of a, kind of a show-and-go in, in baseball vernacular, where these guys just come to the ballpark, they warm up a little bit into cages uh, underneath, don't hit on the field, they just show, and they play baseball for three hours, and then they go, right? And that's it. Go home, get some sleep. So that kind of puts pitching here a little bit more in play than some of the offenses. But uh, this is a seven-game slate. Play Atlanta. You could play some leverage with um, with some lefties. Nolan Jones, Ryan McMahon, for sure. Uh, from the left side of the plate, you can still play Zeke Tovar. And that's probably my favorite. You can still play Elias Diaz. Hit a couple of balls really hard last night uh, in Boston. So maybe coming out of his slump a little. So I think that's fine. Um, I know we spent a lot of time on this game in particular, but it's very important. This is probably the most important game to get right tonight uh, if you're going to win tournaments. Okay, so let's move on. Shohei and Nathan Eovaldi on the mound for the Angels and Rangers. Uh, 10-7 for Shohei. Like, what is going on with Shohei here on the mound? He's been really struggling this season. Walks are back. This is early career Shohei with a ridiculous walk rate. He can't throw it over the damn plate. Um, you know, he's really struggling. He's putting people on base for free. And he's really, honestly, he's um, he's survived here, and he probably shouldn't have. Uh, he's been running really hot, because this is Shohei. He still has 30 three percent K's in the tank but where's the chase right he's throwing six pitches here where's all of the chase just 26 percent O swing like did swing strikes are great call strikes great still generating a lot in the CSW here but this walk rate is very concerning he's elevating his pitch count right and with just a 60 percent average strike one here you know, this really prevents Shohei from going a full seven innings a lot of the time. Now, he's still going five and two-thirds and, and six, right, on average here, but he's increasing his variance, and his price tag's still very high. Um, he's slumping on the mound, and the with a high price tag, I think that makes him, you know, it makes it really difficult for me to get super thrilled about playing him now as i mentioned the projection and the ownership we can take a, li- a lot out of this as of right now um you've got some places that still have him with like a normal hitter projection of nine ten points whatever it is so when they start projecting him five and six points higher this aggregate will tick up same thing with the ownership so we got to keep an eye on this but fundamentally um you know he's still getting ground ball still throwing it past people but he's walking people, putting a lot of guys on base for free. Look at this, 1.8 homers per nine to the lefties this season. It's not a lot of average or anything, but it's power. It's barrel contact and hard contact to the left side. So good thing for the Rangers. They get a pretty damn good left-handed hitter over here, Corey Seager. Um, Nate Lowe's no slouch, right? And so I think these guys are playable 
in leverage stacks, because you're going to see probably double this ownership on Shohei by the time we get down to lock, I would guess. Um, so give me some Corey Seager, 5,500. I'll play him against anybody in baseball at this price tag. I don't care. Uh, even st- like especially guys like Strider. And I don't think there's a, a single pitcher in the majors right now, even like a Jacob deGrom when he's healthy, that I would I would balk at, uh, you know, playing Corey Seager. Split adjusted or, you know, platoon, all that stuff considered. Um, I think he's underpriced. I think he's one of the hitters in baseball that should be north of 6,000 every single day, like Shohei, like Trout, like Jordan Alvarez, et cetera, et cetera. So um, when he is healthy and he is right, this guy, this kid is super dangerous, and that's who I want to play on the other side of Shohei and getting off of some of this ownership. I'm not sure I want to go after Texas with him when he's walking this many people. He certainly has the K stuff in the tank still, and it wouldn't be surprising if he went a full six innings and struck out nine or something here. So he's very much in play. But as are some of these Rangers pieces, you want to play Nate Lowe, Corey Seager, Marcus Semien? Yeah, go ahead. They're at expensive price tags for sure. And it's a pretty low probability spot going after one of the better arms still in baseball, despite the variance here for him. But he's got an 80% strand rate to Shohei, and this is not sustainable. I don't like I know he's a good arm, but it's it's just not. Nobody in baseball has been able to sustain this number. So this is going to tick down, and if he's putting people on base for free, that's how that can happen. So I would not be surprised if he walks Semyon and gives up a two-run bomb to Corey Seager or something here in the first inning, and you're playing from behind already so uh, or something like that. That's very well within range here. But like I said, it's very well within range that he, he goes six or even seven, strikes out ten, something like that. So um, this is a variant spot, I think, for Shohei because this is an incredibly difficult offense to get through. If I had to choose, I would probably prefer Texas. I think they have more collective upside against Shohei. There's some underlying concerns for me here um, with Shohei. I I think he hasn't quite figured it out on the mound. Like, where's the splitter value? Where's the two-seamer value? Break-even cutter value. Four-seamer slider are good still, right? But um, if you're still going to use 15% of your arsenal and give up outs to the field with walks, uh, that, that concerns me a little bit. So uh, I don't think he's a lock here. I do like the price tag a little bit, um, it, but I'm, I'm mostly just kind of lukewarm on it. I kind of like Texas a little bit here. It's probably going to make me look like a like a jackass, but uh, whatever. Uh, Nathan Nivaldi on the mound for the Rangers. Um, I think I'd probably rather play him. He's going to see lower ownership, definitely. Uh, he's been far better this season, definitely. He's got a lower walk rate. He's got a lower barrel rate. Um, he has a higher ground ball rate than Shohei and, you know, the hard contact still a little bit there and worrisome, but not overly. So 33% in aggregate, that's fine. This isn't the 38% that he was exhibiting last year, for example, not giving up power. He's been excellent really over his last, what month, month and a half, uh, price wise, I think it's probably a bit stiff, uh, in general for Evaldi. But I can't I can't lie and say that he hasn't earned this price tag. He's been very good. Um, perhaps the the matchups have been a little bit noisy and in his favor. And for example, in his last start against Tampa, they got to him. He went six and a third, struck out six, gave up four, earned a walk three batters. Right. So in difficult matchups, which I think the Angels are here, um, you know, 108 WRC plus, average strikeout rate, average average allowed or average four rather, 33 percent hard, buck 80 ISO. Like, you still have to get through Shohei at the plate, even though he's slumping on the mound. That's certainly not happening in the batter's box for him. Trout is. He's going to strike out probably a lot in this matchup. But Taylor Ward doesn't strike out a lot, nor does Anthony Rendon. Um, Yeah, so it's a little bit sticky to to get through here. At an elevated price tag, I think you could still come off of Eovaldi as well. But if I had to choose, I'd prefer him to Shohei. I'd prefer Texas to the Angels. But I think everybody is certainly in play. Two good offenses, split adjusted here with some really, really damn good hitters, and two really good arms uh, on the mound, despite um, you know my slight bearishness on both of them. So I, I think everybody is really in play here. Um, and I think this is a... Interesting tournament builds. If you can get to some of these guys, yeah, go ahead. Uh, But I wouldn't totally write off the hitters here. I think they're very much in play.
Okay, Pittsburgh and Chicago. Yohan Oviedo on the mound um, for the Pirates. 7200 for him. I think this puts him in play price tag-wise. He's okay, middling projection-wise and value score so far. 10% ownership is fine. Um, what I'm really concerned with is the whiffs that we saw earlier in the season have totally go- evaporated. Like, where'd they go? Good slider and curveball value so far. He needs to use a changeup more, I think. It's mostly the four-seamer that's plaguing him, giving up two outs to the fields because he can't throw for a damn strike. Early in the count, later in the count, he's really struggling with it. 10.5% walk rate, 57% strike one. There's just no chase. He can't. He's throwing this slider and this curveball for way too many strikes here. He needs to bury this and get some more swing and miss, and that'll increase, increase his strikeout rates, but he's just not getting it. 16% strikeout rate to the right side with a good slider. Like, he's throwing this over the plate way, way, way too much. Same thing with curveball. Just 22% strikeout rate to the lefties. So um, he's not giving up a lot of power necessarily. So that kind of takes me off of the Cubs here. And what puts him in play is a good barrel rate and a good ground ball rate, really to both sides. He's about neutral to the righty. So kind of a reverse split here a little bit, despite good slider value. Um, Where I'm mostly interested in playing him at this price tag is because of the weather. you got a 15-mile-an-hour wind blowing in your face, and it's only 60 degrees at Wrigley tonight. So there are very few ballparks that I, I really consider uh, anything south of a 15-mile-an-hour wind to be um, significant. Uh, Wrigley is definitely one of them. Outside of that, it's like 20 miles an hour uh, or more, or I, I don't even get off the couch with it for the most part. Wrigley is is that it's not the case there. 50 miles an hour in your face. It's super difficult to get the baseball up in the air and over the wall, you know, into the baskets here at, um, you know, when you got a headwind uh, blowing into your face here. So <clears throat> that mostly takes me off of the Cubs. However, they're at very cheap price tags. I think my favorite play here would be a 2,600 Mike Talkman leading off. He's been great recently. I think Nico's fine at 48. He's expensive. Uh, but he's not generally going to hit the ball over the wall anyway. You're playing him for gap power and doubles power, things like that down the line. Um, stealing bases, perhaps. Say Suzuki, he's cheap at 37. He's got enough power to get through that wind. Ian Happ, okay from the left side, 3,800. He's fine. Dansby, a little stiff at 49, not my favorite. Chris Morrell, plenty of power at 44. That's okay. Matt Mervis, don't really want to do this, even at 2,500. Um... You know, with a 50-mile-an-hour wind blowing in his eye. So, eh, I'm kind of lukewarm on the Cubs here, which I think puts Juan Oviedo in play, despite de- depressed strikeout stuff at just 20% in aggregate. Um, not my favorite. I'd rather just, like, get down a little bit lower or get up a little bit higher. We'll get to some other guys here soon. Marcus Stroman on the mound for the Cubs. 8,700 for him. He's going to see a lot of ownership, too, and I think this is a fine spot. Um Strikeout stuff to the left side way down, but he's not giving up any production. You know, 181 average allowed, 260 woven, and 082 ISO with a three and a half ground ball to fly ball ratio with an 18% line drive rate. I mean, it's just elite. Um, so you can get away with a lower strikeout rate if the ground ball stuff is this high. Like last season, for example, Marcus Stroman was only in the, the one and a half and two range with the ground ball stuff, uh, ground ball per fly ball. I mean, he's increased that by 50% or 100% even this season, like, that's fantastic. So with hard contact rates sub-30%, line drive rates sub-20%, very high ground ball rates, I'm okay with a lower aggregate strikeout rate for a guy. Walk rate is a little bit higher for him um, this season. It's mostly to the left side. But again, I'm okay with that when he puts a couple of guys on base for free. He's not giving up hard contact and power, and he's getting so many ground balls that he can get out of this with a lot of double play type of stuff. So despite a 12.5% walker, it's not a good figure. Let's not get it confused. Um, but I'm I'm really okay with this when the ground ball rate is this high to both sides of the plate. He can walk a lefty, and then 60% of the time, the next hitter is going to hit a ground ball and he's going to get a double play out of it, right? So I'm okay with a lot of this stuff here. He's still got fine strike one and a very low barrel rate with decent chase at 30%. Swing strikes are at 10%. That's fine for a ground ball rate this high. 27% CSW, it's okay. Now the strain rate is a little bit high at 79, 80%, but this is, he he could sustain something like this in the upper 70s 
probably a bit high by a couple of ticks right now, but he can still sustain something like this with such high ground ball stuff. So um, I think this puts him in play. 8,700 is a very playable price tag, and Pittsburgh is fine um, to go after with very high ground ball pitchers because they're really not all that impressive. 163 ISO, it's, it's, it's average. 31% hard contact, it's average. 23% K rate, it's average. Um, you know, they're an average creation offense, and you got the weather. So I think Marcus Stroman is very much in play here. And I think I'd probably just rather play him than Oviedo and play Stroman with uh, another 7K guy who we'll get to uh, in a few. Um, so that's kind of where I am, mostly off of offense here. You can play always play Jackson Winsky, maybe a Carlos Santana if you want to get off of it, uh, or a Brian Reynolds. They're okay, but everybody else, uh, I don't want any of the righties. Um, don't really want pretty much any offense here because Stroman's not going to get beat up. He's not going to give up hard and barrel contact. So kind of off of Pittsburgh almost exclusively here, and I like Stroman a decent bit. Okay, here is that 7K guy that I think we can get to. Mackenzie Gore, I think, is a really interesting tournament spot for him tonight. Um, his main problem this season has actually been to the lefties. Power-wise and average-wise, he's given up a 350 to the left side, 435 Woba with a 17% walk rate and a 191 ISO, 41% hard contact. What are we doing here? Two homers per nine, two left-handers. Um, that's bad fastball command. It's piping this, and he's hanging his curveball. It's kind of a, a straight and up-and-down curveball. And he hangs this over the middle of the plate, and lefties can really get after him with it. Um, slider's been very good, and he throws this a, a decent bit to right. He's, he's still induced whiffs against the left side, but we're not worried about lefties here tonight. They have one left-hander, right, Houston, and that's Kyle Tucker. And it'll probably just walk him, and I'm fine if you want to avoid Kyle Tucker and go after a totally washed Jose Abreu. Um, who just is going to ground into a double play nine times out of ten or something freaking stupid. So I think this is a very good spot and really interesting tournament spot for Mackenzie Gore. I think he has 25 and even north of that in the tank here tonight. Now, I recognize that this is generally a, a pretty bad strikeout matchup for uh, any left-hander in baseball, right? 18% strikeout rate. This is the Houston of old. They create a lot, 183 ISO. Just 32% hard contact, though. That's kind of fishy. It's mostly medium type of contact. They do hit it on a line, and they don't strike out. They make a lot of contact, of course. Hit for a decent bit of average, 260 here. They're very serviceable if you want to just stack all the righties. And he's still giving up his gore at 175 ISO here with 33% hard contact. Fewer, fly, or fewer ground balls, rather. More fly balls. But he's only on a line here at 17% in a pretty respectably large sample, 215 hitters, give or take. Um, I think he's in play. I think he's very much in play at 5% ownership. And I like this price tag here at 7,800 going after Houston, who's missing their, their best hitter. Uh, now, the, the top four guys are going to be difficult to get through, right? Mo DeBone, Josie Altuve, Alex Bregman, Kyle Tucker. They don't strike out a lot, and they're damn good hitters. But Jose Abreu... Not necessarily going to strike out a lot, but he stinks, and he's totally washed. Jeremy Pena's dealing um, with some sort of stomach bug or or the flu or whatever it is, and I think he's still overpriced, and he does strike out a lot. Guys down at the bottom of the lineup, they're going to strike out too, and Martin Maldonado just kind of stinks. So certainly not an offensive catcher. Um, I think that puts Mackenzie Gore in play here at 7,800. I think the lack of strikeout upside in the partic this particular matchup is kind of priced in, and he's not in the 9Ks where he's been in his last several starts anymore. Uh, in tournaments on a seven-game slate, this is the guy in the 7K range that I want to play as opposed to Yohan Oviedo, despite the weather difference and getting a much, much more difficult matchup. Um, I think the upside for Gore is much higher than Oviedo, and he's only 600 more expensive, and he's half the ownership there. So I'm going to try and get to a little bit of Mackenzie Gore. Uh, I think he's in play in really all formats. Maybe not so much in cash, but um, really all contest formats, I should say. Javier on the mound. He's in play, too, but 10-2, like, eh, I'm kind of lukewarm on this. Like, he's only a 25% K-rate guy this year. He's down eight ticks from last season. Like, what is going on here? Change up. Still doesn't throw anything. Um... It, as far as usage with this pitch, and it's still bad. And he's mostly a two, two-and-a-half pitch guy. He throws a curveball that he hangs a lot of the time. 
Um, but he's a 60% four-seamer, which is a good pitch, right? Still gets a lot of swing and miss to the right side there. Same thing with the slider, a lot of swing and miss there. But look at this delta in the strikeout rate, 18% to left-handers versus 33% to the righties. I don't want a single righty from Washington against him, but I think some left-handers here are very much in play, and they're probably going to have six lefties in the lineup tonight. I think this is a very worrisome spot for Christian Javier. 20% ownership here. I think he'd probably come in under or even come off of this completely tonight. He's not walking people, which is, you know, obviously a detriment to full Washington stacks. You generally don't want to do that with them anyway. But 55% strike one rate, it's preventing him from going far deeper into games than he would otherwise. He's got an 11% barrel rate, and that's to hard contact to the right side of the plate. So despite the high strikeout stuff there, he gives up a boatload of fly balls here. Good bit of line drives at 20% to both sides, 37% hard to righties, 29% and barrel contact to the lefties where he gives up a 203 ISO. I think he's a little bit attackable here with a couple of these guys. Luis Garcia at 3,400. I think he's a damn good price, to be honest, a fine spot. Jamer at 36. I think this is okay as well. Corey Dickerson, 2,200. I think he's a killer play in the outfield. And you could even consider, like, a Kbert throw in a one of the righties if you want. Um, one of the lower strikeout guys like a Lane Thomas at the top of the lineup or a Joe Mianessis. He'll probably strike out a good bit. Um, so I'm not super crazy about him tonight. But we want guys that are going to be able to make contact from the right side because when it is contact, it's barrel contact and it's loud. So... I'm not super thrilled about going after Javier. I think there's something seriously wrong in the underlying metrics here. Strand rate's still very high. It's because he got whiffed up to the right side, but they're going to go lefty heavy here tonight and give up some fly balls and some hard contacts. Now, I want ground ball and line drive hitters because he gives up so many fly balls, and full stacking against him is kind of difficult, uh, certainly with a, guy, with a team that's not going to hit it over the wall. Buck 20 ISO here, 31% hard. Buck 50 ground ball to fly ball. This is an okay batted ball profile matchup for Washington against Javier. So give me a couple of these cheap lefties, like I mentioned, Garcia, Jamer, Corey Dickerson in particular. Um, I think that's a really nice tournament stack, and nobody's going to be on that. Um, I think they're popping pretty hard in value here so far, and Javier is a little bit susceptible to getting beat up uh, by a very high contact team. So no thank you with a lot of this 20-plus percent ownership on Javier. I'd come in under this because I think it's a terrible matchup for him and rather play some other guys. So I think uh, a lot of stuff, really interesting tournament stuff is in play here. Don't get me wrong. You play some of the low strikeout bats from Houston, but I'm going to play Mackenzie Gore and have to side with him tonight. I like that in tournaments. Okay, Cleveland, San Diego, Logan Allen on the mound. I'm probably just going to leave him off the shelf. Would rather just get up to Gore uh, or even a Yohan uh, Oviedo in this particular matchup. This is a tough spot for him. The Padres on the other side, they're also not going to strike out a lot. About average here, split adjusted, uh, 22%. 200 ISO, though, with a, you know, not impressive hard contact rate. They make a lot of medium plus contact here. But they create, right? And last night, for example, you saw Tatis, Soto, Nelson Cruz hit balls out. Uh, Machado hit a ball out. So this offense is really, looks like they're starting to uh, significantly heat up. And this is an okay batted ball matchup for them. Logan Allen struggling a little bit against right-handers, certainly with the swing and miss, just 22% K rate. That's average. 286 average allowed. That's a pretty elevated figure. Buck 30 ground ball to fly ball, that's a fine number, but 36% hard contact is a little suspicious here. I'd want this ground ball number to be a bit higher if I'm going to stomach eating a hard contact like that with very little soft contact induced uh, to the righty. So um, I think I want to get to some Padres again here tonight, and they're kind of an off-the-board stack. They're very expensive still, but they're far less expensive than Atlanta and, um, and the Dodgers, who we'll get to. Tatis at 6,000. Yeah, let's do it. He stole two bases too last night. Uh, Soto at 54. Okay, that's fine. When he starts seeing the baseball, um, you play him against every lefty out there. It doesn't really matter. Machado too, 48. That's fine. And Babe Sanchez behind the plate, 3,500. I like this price and I like this spot for him. A pretty decent bit. Xander Bogart's 47. Still dealing a little bit with the wrist. 
But uh, they got Nelly Cruz back, I believe, just last night. 2,400, he's a fine first base play. You can consider mixing in a Hassan Kim or Brandon Dixon. Um, both of those guys are playable as well. So I like Padre stacks here going after some Logan Allen. I'm probably just going to leave him on the shelf. Even though I do like the arm, I do like the upside. And this is a really tough spot, and I think the Padres offense is very much heating up. Um, so I want to go after um, any plus matchup that I can get with him. Ryan Weathers on the mound. Now, he's got velo here, right? 95. He hides the baseball pretty well. The problem with Weathers is that he just doesn't throw it past anybody. He's got a decent changeup, decent slider, but he throws the same-handed change a little bit too much for my liking, um, which turns it into a pretty weak fastball. He's only got 7 and 8 miles an hour with a velo delta. If you're throwing a same-handed change, I'd like it to be a little bit higher, you know, pushing 10 miles an hour or so. Um that really drops the spin rate and gets you a lot more swing and miss against same-handed hitters. And that's not really the case when you only got a 7 and 8 mile an hour delta on it. Uh, in any case, he struggles mostly with fastball command. Like I said, it's good velo and he hides it well, but he has trouble throwing it for a strike early in the count. And it does translate to a little bit of a an elevated walk rate here at 9%. Stays off of the barrel, which is great. I think he's mostly in play sometimes, but at 6,500, I'm not super interested there. Against Cleveland, they're a very low strikeout team as it is. And he doesn't really have any chase. He's only got three pitches. He's not going to go super deep into the game here. And you're only going to see probably four and two-thirds, maybe five innings out of him. And that's probably about it. So 6,500, I think the price tag's probably a little elevated for him. Uh, if he were 58 or something like that, I think you'd maybe consider it and try and squeeze fifty or uh, five innings out of him and 90 pitches or something, but uh, they limit his pitch count because he didn't strike anybody out. So you're probably only going to get two times through the lineup here. And that puts Cleveland in play. Uh, mostly some of the right-handers here, right? 313 average allowed, 385 Woba. It's not because of a walk rate necessarily. It's a lot of contact here, 200, av or 200 ISO. And, you know, some fly balls, neutral ground ball to fly ball. 26% hard contact is good. So that's what would kind of keep him into ballpark, so to speak, against Cleveland. Um, but overall, not super interested in this. But you know, sub 10% ownership. You want to play a correlated Padres, and and you know, stack. Uh, you know, go with like a three-man Atlanta, three-man Dodgers, or you know, one of the other teams we talked about uh, with a five-man Padres or something. I think that's in play here with Weathers because he's cheap enough where you can make that happen. So. Uh, that's kind of where I stand on that. Not super thrilled about playing him, but uh, this seven-game slate, and you can really mix that in. If I had to choose between the two, I'd certainly just play Weathers over Logan Allen, even in a bad strikeout matchup for him. So overall, I'm pretty much off, but uh, offense usually um, only for me here. Med Rosario, 3,200. That's a pretty okay price. Josie Ramirez, 4,500. Now we're talking. That's a good price, too. Um, and you can play like a Gabby Arias or something like that. He's 2,300. Zanino hit a ball to the wall last night somehow, got on the barrel. Uh, he's 2,600. You can play that too. Um, maybe a Miles Straw, 23. Very cheap over here is Cleveland, so it's okay if you want to uh, go after this here. But however, San Diego's bullpen been one of the best in the league all season, and they play excellent, excellent defense. So overall, pretty much off of Cleveland for the most part. Okay, let's get to the last game. Dylan Cease, no chance I play him. Uh, against Dot, just zero. I'm not even going to spend the time ranting about his walk rate. He yanks the slider against right-handers, and he gives up a boatload of... Look at this hard contact number against right-handers. 46% to righties. Like, what are you doing? Um, he's he's totally broken. And even at 8,200, I'm not going near 10% ownership in a horrible, horrible matchup for him. Maybe eventually he's going to make me look like a moron with this, but uh, I'm just not dealing with it. He cannot throw strikes. I'd be shocked if he goes more than five innings in this particular matchup. Dodgers have the highest split-adjusted walk rate on the day. This is one of the highest rates in baseball, to be honest. 112 WRC+, plus average strikeout rate, 36% hard contact rate. This is, what, the third highest split-adjusted number on the day to Atlanta and to Texas. 36% um, hard contact over a 2,000 PA sample is out of control good 203 iso 
incredibly dangerous matchup for Dylan Cease here. Uh, I want to play the Dodgers if I can make it happen. Problem is, top four guys are super expensive. 64 for Mookie, 63 for Freddie Freeman. That's a fine price for him. That's where he should be, but like it's still over 6K. Will Smith, 58. JD is 54. Now, Dodger stacks are much easier to get to because they have um, everybody else you know, down in the, what, the five hole or lower in the lineup is 3K or cheaper. Miguel Vargas is 3,200, right? Um, everybody else is under 3,000. So sure, easy enough to get there with Dodger stacks and go after Dylan Cease. And that's kind of how I want to do this. Um, I don't want anything to do with him tonight. I know the strike one is good. I know that he still has a 27% CSW. And perhaps we're looking for a positive regression figure in the strand rate, but he is not good against the right side. And if you can't even get uh, keep guys off of base, he's got a 13% walk rate against left or right-handers here. Like he's better actually against lefties, but where he still gives up a, a 195 ISO and one and a half homers per nine. So he's going to walk people, and the Dodgers are going to hit the baseball out of the yard here with a you know at a pretty high clip against Dylan C. So I'm not interested at all. Even on a seven-game slate, um, you know, I know like Ranger Suarez, for example, very low upside arms, took the Dodgers apart. And it's it's within range for him. You know, it's not like it's a total zero outcome uh, necessarily, but I'm still not doing it. I don't like the guy. There's way too much variance. I'm certainly not playing him. Would it take me off of the Dodgers? Yeah, maybe in a single entry because of the price tags, but... Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I'd rather just play him, and, you know, if I get beat, I get beat. It, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of go to bat with that, I think. Uh, Michael Grove on the mound for L.A., 5,200. This puts him in play, 5,200. Um, we talked about this last several days, and literally every time you see a pitcher, a starting pitcher that's stretched out, that's got five innings in the tank, he's in play at 5,000. That's just a fact of the matter. He's a really good value score here, as a matter of fact. 10% ownership, you want to play correlated Dodger stacks, I think that's okay. Going after the White Sox, they're a super low upside team, 81 WRC+. plus. They don't create. They did just get Eloy Jimenez back, but they lost Juan Moncada, who's dealing with back issues again. So this damn team, they just can't stay healthy. I don't know what it is with Chicago. There's got to be something in the water over there uh, on the south side. Like I don't know what the hell's going on. 150 ISO, 28, 29% hard contact rate, average strikeout rate, so they're going to make contact, but it's weak contact, right? And it's on the ground. So, yeah, sure. I mean, Michael Grove's got problems. He's only a two-pitch guy, so that's what's mostly going to take me off of him here. If either one of these pitches is bad, and they're pretty likely to be bad because the four-seamer's not all that great, and the slider's not all that great, if either one of them is bad, like, you got one pitch, and now you're totally screwed here, and even a low upside off can, can take you apart. We saw what they did to Kershaw, for example, last night when he didn't even he didn't have his best stuff. Michael Grove's A-plus stuff isn't even as good as Kershaw's, like, C stuff. So that puts the White Sox in play, and they're, they're popping here a little bit in value so far, mostly because they're still pretty cheap. Only guy you got to pay for is Luis Robert at 4,800. Eloy's at 43. It's fine. You can play Benintendi, I guess, at 2,900. Um, and Tim Anderson, you can play at 42. Gavin Sheets, though, I think split adjusted is probably going to be my favorite price play here. He's 2,000 at the Stone Min, so I like that. He's Mighty Grandal. Um, he got into a ball a little bit last night, looked a little bit better at the plate. And he's 3,300. Would like him from the left side a little bit more anyway. So I think that's a fine catcher play. You can get to a kind of a an off-the-board little short white sock stack that's very cheap. A Grandal, Gavin Sheets, mix in a, I don't know, in a lawyer or a Tim Anderson or somebody that's not going to strike out a lot. Luis Roberts, fine, whatever. Um, I think that's an okay construction and something to consider and don't totally neglect tonight. Um, so I'm going to maybe try and squeeze a couple of those in. Some really good value plays over here from the White Sox. So uh, most everybody here is in play for me outside of Dylan Cease. I'm not touching him. So, okay, that's it for the seven-game um, Thursday here. Let's quickly uh, review Detroit and Minnesota. Short Detroit stack is in play here against Sonny Gray, but I want all of the Sonny Gray as much as I can get. Matt Boyd also in play at the price tag, 5,800. I think that's fine. Minnesota going to pop mostly because they're cheap and they make a lot of hard contact. Um, so they're in play, and a couple of these guys 
are really, really good value plays, notably a Kyle Farmer, Carlos Correa, Ryan Jeffers types in the middle of the lineup. Royce Lewis as well. Colorado and the Braves, a mostly off of offense here, most because of the travel nonsense. Not that it, they're not fundamentally good matchups. Uh, of course, you can get to Atlanta. They're going to be mega popular, and they're pretty damn expensive uh, in full stacks. I think my favorites are probably just going to be one-offs like Austin Riley um, in very contrarian teams. Marcelo Zuna, of course, at 3,600, et cetera, et cetera. And from Colorado, give me Ryan McMahon and Nolan Jones from the left side. But you can play Zeke Tover again. He'll probably still be in the two-hole up at the top. Brenton Doyle. Uh, has a little bit of upside. If you want to run like a four-man kind of wraparound shenanigans with Colorado, I think that's okay. Angels, Texas, a little bit of offense here I think is in play with some really good hitters. Shohei, I'd, you know, I'd almost rather pay 10-7 and play him as a hitter today than play him on the mound against Texas. That's how bullish I am on, on Texas's offense just in general. Even in this matchup, give me a good bit of Corey Seager, I think. I think it's an excellent spot at 5,500 to get leverage on the field. I have to keep an eye on Shohei's ownership and projection. Those will drift up, and the noise and the standard deviations will flesh out, um, will come out of these numbers here as we move on. Nathan Eovaldi also in play, also a difficult matchup at an elevated price tag for these guys. So kind of lukewarm on the pitching, even though they're both in play. Would like to get to some, a little bit of offense here if I can, and get a little bit of leverage on the field. Um, but I'm going to have some pretty much of everybody, I think. Pittsburgh, Chicago, weather game, anti-weather game here. Um, Marcus Stroman on the mound. I like this a good bit. 8,700. Upside maybe capped a little bit at that price tag, but uh, very much in play, certainly, against Pittsburgh. Yohan Oviedo in play as well if you land on this at 10% ownership. But I think I'd rather just play Mackenzie Gore on the other side uh, rather than um, Yohan Oviedo at 70 uh, they're in the next game, rather, is Mackenzie Gore, rather than Yohan Oviedo at 7,200. Kind of off of offense for the most part. Um, don't really want to deal with this 50-mile-an-hour wind in my face. <clears throat> um, outside of, like, a Mike Talkman, maybe, 2,600. Pretty good play there. Washington, short stacks here against Christian Javier. I got, I think he's he's really fishy here, and I don't really want to play this. I'm going to come in underweight, and I might just X him out of the pools and just play the other guys. Um, even though it's a good suppression matchup, Production-wise, this is a very high-contact team, and they're super difficult to get through with a guy that cannot strike out a lefty. He's got an 18% K rate against the left side. No thanks. Uh, but a good bit of Mackenzie Gore here in a very difficult matchup, I think. I'm going to take shots, and I think this is super, super sneaky. Um, you don't need to get a lot of leverage on the field, or get a lot of ownership, rather, and exposure to get leverage on the field. I think this is fine to get 15 20% even. Uh, I think it's a pretty shrewd tournament play. Cleveland-San Diego offenses... Pretty much exclusively here. Price tags do put these guys in play. I'm off of Logan Allen. I'm going to get to the Padres. I like them a good bit tonight. And Ryan Weathers is in play at 65, but I'd rather just play some other guys, I think. Uh, he's not going to go deep enough into the game for me to get too thrilled there. White Sox short stacks are in play here against Michael Grove. Full stacks are in play because Michael Grove only has two pitches. And Dodgers for sure if you want to go after Dylan Cease like I do because I'm not touching him, and I want to play the Dodgers. So top stacks certainly are Atlanta, uh, the Dodgers, and, you know, who else we have here? Um, that's pretty much it. But I think a lot of stuff is really in play here. You can get different on seven-game slates, as you can usually. So keep an eye out, once again, for projections and ownership updates and the Shohei numbers in particular. Good luck to everybody on Thursday. We'll catch you tomorrow for a big Friday.